This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Bagley. Summertime. It may not be the ideal time to fish compared to the wonders of spring and fall fishing, but if summer is when you have the time, when you buy your license, when you have vacation time, and when your kids are out of school, then we will talk to the pros you hear each week on our fishing report and get their advice on how to make your trip this summer one to remember as we go inside outdoors on Kentucky Afield Radio. It's crime time. The Gauntlet at Otter Creek, Kentucky's premier mud run. Come run the gauntlet, just 20 minutes south of Louisville. Miles of slime pits, net climbing, and obstacle-filled adventure. Adrenaline in a flood of mud. Run solo, form a team. Run five miles or eight for everyone 12 and up. The Gauntlet at Otter Creek. Saturday, August 17th. Get the dirt on the gauntlet at Otter Creek at KentuckyWildlife.com. Skydiving, motorcycles, I love it. But none of that's as scary as telling someone what they don't want to hear. Helicopter rescue swimmer, Mike Bearski, United States Coast Guard. Boating fatalities leave everyone speechless. Jet skiing, tubing, fishing, canoeing. If you hit the water to wind up or to wind down, I'm never scared to say. Make sure your life jacket's got your back. Kentucky conservation officers remind you, your life jacket's got your back. And the backing of the best swimmers everywhere. This is Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. Kentucky Field Radio is fortunate to be able to tap some of the very best in the business. And by that, I mean the wildlife and fisheries biologist of this state, the folks in charge of various programs, deer or elk or black bear or fish. Every week you'll hear on our program a fishing report and that features the district fisheries biologist scattered around the state, but that's a short report. Always nice to be able to talk to these district biologists a little bit more in depth. You know, this is the time of year a lot of people will fish, not because it's the best time of the year, but this is when they have their vacation. Their kids are on break from school, and they bought the fishing license, and they're on the creek, or they're on the lake. So we talk to some of these district biologists and get their advice on how to make the most of a summer fishing trip. In western Kentucky, that individual is Paul Reister. Well, we've entered into, as you mentioned, the summertime, uh, and so we're changing the summertime fishing patterns in contrast to springtime when the fish are up shallow and you can catch them while they're spawning and things like that. Now they're going to become a little bit tougher, but there's things you can do to increase your success. Summertime is a great time to fish for blue cats out on the main river channel. Current is a big um, factor there, so... You know, when TVA is, is making hydropower, of course, Kentucky Lake is a hydropower dam, and so whenever they're drawing power, um, water to make power through the dam, it creates current. And so out on the river channel, the, the shad come out there to feed on plankton, and then, of course, the blues go out there to feed on shad. And so this time of the year is a good time to go out there and what we call bounce the bottom with uh, a piece of lead and some night crawlers or some cut bait or some small live minnows. And, and, and target those blue cats. Another interesting thing about the summertime is the willow fly hatch. Try to move it up along the shoreline where you see a branch overhanging the lake, and if it looks like it's got a lot of bugs around it, those are mayflies, and, and those mayflies are an aquatic insect for part of their life, and then they come out to mate. But there's a lot of feeding frenzies going on right underneath that tree limb that's hanging out over the water. As far as bass, you've got ledge fishing pretty slow you go out there and you just deep dive crankbaits and tube jigs and and uh, worms kind of slow fishing but you're finding those drops stumps that are on the drops fishing in that deep water style another interesting thing about the summertime is the small shad that are starting to grow up and they are congregating around brush in the back of the embayments and so late in the evening is one of my favorite times to go fishing for bass is to target that brush that's in four, five, six foot of water where you've got a lot of shad minnows and throwing maybe a little spinner bait, a worm works really well, a shallow diving crankbait around that brush, and you're going to get those bass up there that are feeding. And you're not going to catch some great big bass, but you're going to catch a lot of 
uh, you know, keeper size to 12 inch size that are sublegal and you have to throw back. But it's a lot of fun. You have some areas in western Kentucky that eastern Kentucky, other parts of the state, don't have in their areas. And I'm thinking about uh, cypress swamps, tupelo trees. I mean, you look like you're down in Cajun country in Louisiana. Uh, you have a lot of beaver down there, a lot of beaver dams. I can imagine, I remember uh, spending a little bit of time out in the vicinity of Obion Creek. The opportunities to fish in western Kentucky aren't limited, of course, to Kentucky Lake and Barkley, although they are the big draws. What are some of the sort of the hidden, unmentioned places that are great to go in the summer for fishing? You're right. Kentucky and Barkley Lake are kind of the premier. That's where everybody goes. So if you're wanting to get away, small John Boat type fishing for panfish, crappie bass, catfish, uh, you can go to those oxbow lakes. We have several down at the Ballard Wildlife Management Area, Doug Travis Wildlife Management Area, several of our wildlife management areas along the lower Mississippi, lower Ohio River in that area, uh, Fulton County, Hickman County, up through that stretch, Ballard County. And so these oxbow lakes are a great place to get up in those cypress trees. Those fish are up around the, uh, those, uh, the, the knees and stuff, those cypress trees where it's cooler. And so some really interesting fishing. Of course, the thing there, everybody's heard about the Asian carp, and so they have kind of made that fishing a little bit more interesting in the fact that there's higher concentrations of Asian carp in some of those oxbow lakes, and so you got to watch for Asian carp jumping. But there's a unique thing you can try there, is if you catch one in your boat, they're going to jump in your boat with you. Just throw one or two of them on ice and try them. The silver carp are excellent to eat. It's a white meat. If you put it on ice, take it home, fillet it out, work around the bones, you've got you some good white meat. Now, I want to go back because there's one other type of fishery that I didn't even get to mention when we're thinking about those oxbow lakes is Mayfield Creek, uh, Clarks River, um, some of these creeks that go up off the Mississippi River. We have found some excellent crappie populations and small bass uh, up in those drainages during the summertime. You know, if you, you get out on the main lake or the main river and it's too rough for you, go up into some of those creek channels and fish around some brush piles. Again, that's... Western Kentucky has is, is got all types of fishing. Big lakes, small lakes, rivers, creeks, you can find it all. It is a scenic area there. I remember seeing bald eagle nests. I remember Swan Lake. Absolutely beautiful. You would look out at that and think, there is no way I'm in Kentucky. Oh, and there's someplace else that I rarely ever hear mentioned when talking about fishing in western Kentucky, and that's the Mississippi River. Now, there's a unique place. We have done some sampling on the Mississippi River for uh, white bass, striped bass, hybrid striped bass, and there's a fishery out there that is untapped, not even to mention the catfish. Now, there are some fishermen that, that, that manage to go out on the Mississippi River, and uh, you know they do what they call blocking. It's kind of you know, big chunks of star foam uh, jug-type fishing for channel catfish and fishing those deep holes. But if you get around some of the wing dikes, like just down river from Columbus Belmont State Park, which is a beautiful boat ramp there go down river within a mile and you can see some wing dikes get around those wing dikes uh now this is kind of a, a dangerous fishery i mean if you got, got a small boat this isn't a small boat type fishery uh, you need something that's stable but you can get down there and anchor off just outside of the current in those eddies and, and cast a you know like a four inch sassy shad up there or maybe some live minnows and you're going to get into some really nice white bass striped bass hybrid striped bass um, and again, not a lot of people doing it. It's intimidating if you've not ever been on the big Mississippi River, but uh, it can be safe if you take your time. Where's the best place to get a, get some barbecue near you? If I'm in Murray, I'm going to Bad Bob's. Bad Bob's. If I'm up around the lake, I'm going to Nose. Absolutely. I enjoy it. Let me ask you this. I had asked some of your other counterparts around the state, on advice on learning to lie when you fish. Kentucky fishing will make a liar out of you because it's fun, but when you catch a fish, by the time you call somebody and tell them about the catch, that fish better had doubled in size. So what's your theory or what's your advice on being able to spread some untruths about what you've caught? A lot of people, um, they think they know what... 10 inches looks like on a crappie or 15 inches looks like on a bass but you're right charlie is that uh, when somebody gets that fish on it and especially if it doesn't get in the boat you know if it breaks off right at the boats 
it always gains a pound or two. Sure. We kind of get tickled when we're doing some of our bass sampling and shocking and stuff. Is is we'll shock up this 12 inch bass with a leader coming out of its mouth where somebody lost the bait. You know, it's got a worm down its throat, and and we kind of chuckle. At, somebody probably had that on and probably thought they had a three pound bass, but they never saw it. It broke off. They probably did. You know, fishing's one of those things. There's nobody there to call you on it. And if there is, I'm sure that you are in cahoots. Paul Reister, District Fisheries Biologist out of Western Kentucky. We are out of time for the segment, but thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm Charlie Baglin. Stay with us. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. Lazy days of hot summer fishing is the topic on Kentucky Field Radio. This is Charlie Baglin, and our guest in this segment is the District Fisheries Biologist with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. His name is Jeff Crosby, working the central part of the state. You know, a lot of people, this is when they have the chance to fish. They may not be the diehard fishermen or fisherwomen, but if they have a couple weeks off in the summer for vacation, their kids are out of school, this is their opportunity. This is when they buy a license. What advice do you have uh, for them to make the best of it? Well, I'd say, uh, especially this time of year, uh, for instance, if you're fishing for black bass, this is a great time of year. to You want to fish early mornings and, and we'll say, evening hours, kind of in a little bit cooler parts of the day. Uh, it's a great time uh, when these fish move up shallow. Uh, with the water being warm, they're very active. So topwater lures such as you know buzz baits or topwater baits, topwater jerk baits like a Zara Spook or a Sammy are very productive uh, baits this time of year that you can fish in those early morning hours or those late evening hours, especially in lakes that have a little bit of uh, like aquatic vegetation or, or, or good shoreline habitat. Great fishing, especially at those times uh, of the day. Are these places hard to find? Can you just go wherever you would buy bait, let's say, or to the the sporty goods counter at your local Kmart, Walmart, and say, where's a good place to go that I don't have to worry about parking on somebody's private land or getting in trouble or trespassing, but still I can catch a few fish? A lot of your stores uh, will carry a lot of these baits and uh, that are going to be very close to these water bodies. Uh, you know, you can check with the department, you know, with our website. There's a, there's a lot of good information there showing where to fish and, and uh, public access areas. But, again, you know, you could always, uh, you know, ask permission, you know, when you're on those private lands. You at least check with the local landowners. Some will allow, you know, you to fish and others, you know, some won't. But, uh, but uh, you'd rather ask than <laughs> be told no than, you know, not have the opportunity in case someone did say yes. Being considerate of, of the landowner may get you invited back. They just want people to respect their property. Uh, I think most people don't have a problem, you know, with people fishing. But again, just as long as they, sh- you know, you show respect to the land and you know, leave the place the way you found it, and uh, you know, not cause problems, uh, you know, where the landowner has stuff to clean up. Jeff Crosby, you are the district fisheries biologist. In the central part of Kentucky, where are some landmarks in your district? Beaver Lake, Elmer Davis Lake, uh, Gifts Creek Lake. Uh, a lot of these lakes we own the 50 foot around the you know around the entire portions of these lakes. Uh, so therefore, you know, anglers have that ability to you know fish a lot of the banks. Plus, there are some pretty decent areas where parking areas where you can go park. Uh, we've got fishing piers at Elmer and Beaver. Uh, we hope to soon have one at Gist Creek. Uh, we've got other lakes like uh, Corinth Lake, which is a little bit further north that, that a fishing piers just put in. So a lot of these lakes uh, we've got some pretty decent uh, access to. Uh, and, again, you know, we do own some of the properties around, so therefore you can walk some of the banks. Can you comment on stream fishing? The nice thing about some of the streams, I mean, we have some access sites uh, on Elkhorn Creek that is part of our volunteer public access program uh, that you do have some access to, to some of these streams. Uh, you know, there's some decent access on the South Fork licking at various spots due to ramps. But the, the big one in the area that's, that's uh, going to be a real neat opportunity for fishermen is the Floyd's Fork. 
over in Jefferson County, there's going to be a 20-mile stretch of that river that is uh, basically going to be part of it's Century 21 Parks, the parklands of the Floyd's Fork, that is going to be public access. It's going to be public lands for 20 miles of the Floyd's Fork. So there's going to be uh, several spots, access points along that area, along that stream, to, to be able to put a canoe or kayak in. But also it will be weightable, and you will not be trespassing because it is going to be public lands for 20 miles of that stream. So it's going to make a provide a, a wonderful public access uh, for that Louisville area. Floyd's Fork of what? Uh, that, that's part of the Salt River, uh, the Salt River drainage. Uh, but it runs uh, out of Oldham County at, uh, at a, uh, we'll say, a southwest flow uh, back to the uh, Salt River there in Bullock County close to Shepherdsville. So when you say 20 miles... That sounds like it is pretty much limited to Jefferson County. Am I uh, pretty much? It, uh, that twenty-mile stretch basically runs from U.S. sixty uh, down to Bardstown Road uh, is, is the section, and that's about a twenty-mile stretch of, of uh, the Floyd's Fork that will be. Uh, there's there's going to be some really great opportunities for for a lot of different people. Uh, especially, you know, as that series of parks is developed and opened, and uh, those ac- there's more access to be built, and uh, there's a few there now, but uh, but again, that's property that has been purchased through this program and is, that is going to be available for you know citizens of the, of the Commonwealth to use uh, over the, these years to come. Of course, we we got started about to saying, if this is when you have your vacation. And this is when you're gonna fish, or your buddy from out of state has vacation, and he's coming here to, here to fish. This is your opportunity to fish. May not be as active as spring or fall fishing, but would you also want to include in their fin slicks? Very much so. Uh, you know, we have some great opportunities uh, through a lot of these park lakes uh, through our fishing and neighborhoods program. Uh, these fish are being stocked, you know, throughout the summer. So you can, again, check uh, our our web page, you know, at fw.ky.gov uh, to uh, you know find those fins lakes in in, in your given area, and uh, also when when they're being stocked. And uh, throughout, like I say, we we do uh, trout stockings in the winter, but however, we do ch- channel catfish stockings during the summer months. And that does provide some decent fishing. Uh, also, some hybrid bluegill go in during the summer months uh, it, uh, on occasion. And, and again, this provides some great fishing opportunities uh, at these uh, small uh, county park lakes or we'll say uh, city park lakes uh, throughout the summer. And, and you can fish them, you know, pretty much any time of the day, except probably at, well, some may be closed at night. I've, I've had conversations like this with some of your counterparts around the state and I've always asked them part of learning to fish if you're an adult or if you're eight years old is learning to stretch the truth learning to embellish the truth about what you've caught what's your advice there's a saying and I I don't know if I can remember it but uh, you know there was I guess rules that I grew up with is that you you bait your own hook and you catch your own fish and you tell your own lies (laughs) and um so uh, yeah, that, I think that is part of fishing uh, is, is probably embellishing a little bit, but uh, but again, you got to get out there and go fishing in order to to have an opportunity to um, create such stories. I, I think that anybody who fishes sort of knows that what comes with that is this expectation that anything you say, nobody's going to believe. <laughs> but that's probably very true. And I like anybody who fishes. Uh, heaven's sakes, they pay a lot of bills and they. They keep uh, the outdoors a great place to go. Yes, it is. But I, I fish, and I don't know if I've ever once told the truth. <laughs> There's a, <laughs> you have conservation officers that will come out, and you know, they may double check your stringer to make sure that your that your length limit has been met, and. Beyond that, they will not weigh the fish. One of your fellows, I uh, can't remember where, said, um, "Just don't weigh the fish." Because if you weigh the fish, then you're sort of stuck to being close to that weight. But if you don't weigh it, you can just sort of guess. You can guess uh, as high as you want. Yeah. 
Well, I got a friend of mine who I grew up with in, in school, and he said the worst thing he ever did was to buy a uh, one of those digital scales that you could purchase because all his four pounders became two pounders. And uh, so, yeah, you never want to weigh your fish uh, because uh, yeah, you'd, you'd rather stretch the truth, stretch that fish, uh, you know, but even measuring it other than making sure that it meets legal limits. Uh <laughs> Uh, especially if you catch a nice fish, don't don't measure, don't weigh it, and then that four pounder can become a six pounder or eight pounder. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you start weighing it, uh, then you know exactly what it is, and it, they always seem to be a little bit smaller than you expect. Well, I've never thought about it going at it from that perspective. You can always say, "Well, I caught a fish and it was eight pounds," when you know it was four pounds. But you could always say you could tell you could tell something that almost sounds more truthful, saying. Well, this fish, I know, I've been fishing for 20 years, and I know this was a 10-pound bass, but my scale only said it weighed 4 or 5. I may have to get another one because I know, and then and it really does sound like you want to tell the truth in that case. <laughs> yeah, it, but uh, it still makes for a good story. Uh, and it's great when you get out there and you catch that, that fish of a lifetime, or you, you get out there and you have that quality fishing day, and, and uh, it always makes... Uh, every time you tell the story, it always, you always want to make it a little bit better the next time. <laughs> Jeff, thanks so much for your advice. My pleasure. That is the District Fisheries Biologist for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife for the Central District, Jeff Crosby. My name's Charlie Baglin, and we'll be back. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Charlie Baglin on Kentucky Field Radio. Welcome back. Please listen up if I can get your attention. I'm only going to tell you this 1,000 million times. Skipper, don't skip the life jackets. If you're boating this summer, please remember your life jackets got your back. Fishing Report. This is Neil Jackson for your Western Fisheries District. We've had a lot of water moving through the system on Kentucky Lake and Lake Barkley. That caused rising water through the week last week, and it has peaked, and it's now starting to fall. A lot of people that were catching fish last week reported that their patterns had quit working and things had changed up. So, folks, one of the best things about being a good fisherman is figuring out where to go when the fish stop biting. It's a little bit of a trick out there right now, but the catfish typically do well when the water's rising backs of the bays they move up and start eating we're currently experiencing a mayfly hatch on the lake which is fun for a lot of different species you can move up to overhanging vegetation where the mayflies drop into the water and catch bluegill and catfish and even bass hitting on the surface it's a good time to break out your fly rod when that's going on good luck and be safe out there hi this is john williams for the fish report for southeast kentucky at lake cumberland the stropper fishing's been good of late uh, stroppers are in much better shape this year they're growing good and most of the fish now are 25 to 30 feet deep being caught on live shad or elk lives drifted at the mouths of creeks and main lake points so the stropper fishing has been really good so give that a try walleye fishing has been a little bit slow on the lake but they should be similar depths probably 20 to 25 feet on the main lake points so you can catch those on bottom bouncers with nightcrawler rigs or deep diving crankbaits elsewhere in the district summertime is a good time to go stream fishing we have a variety of sunfish in most of our streams in the Cumberland River drainage including uh, red breast sunfish which are good in McQuarrie, Bell, Knox and Willie County and about any tributary to the Cumberland River system, and those can be caught on worms or crickets or uh, small crankbaits or inline spinners. And as always, good luck and good fishing. With both the reservoirs and rivers being high, this is a good time to concentrate on some of our smaller lakes, such as Carpenter Lake or Lake Malze. Malze has some nice bass, fish in the five to six foot depth range on some of the brush piles that are out in the middle of the lake. Carpenter, anglers have been doing well catching channel catfish, as well as picking up a few red ear along the steeper banks. At no land, anglers have been fishing the jumps and catching primarily black bass, although a few white bass have been caught as well. Lake Malone, anglers are catching a lot of small bass fishing the shoreline cover. Some of the larger bass are being picked up at the 10 to 12 foot depths by fishing some of the offshore structures such as rock piles or submerged logs or brush. That's an update from Northwestern Fishery District. Please remember, wear your life jackets and be safe on the water. It's not easy reaching your arms around a giant white oak tree. Mom, I can't reach your hand. 
It's not easy finding one either, but old growth woodlands are another example of what Kentucky Nature license plates work to protect. Big tree. And even though this boy's in fifth grade, he might see college before those fingertips meet. And with some of these trees, he may still need a little help from his sister. Oh, brother. Kentucky Nature plates. No wonder they say nature's finest. Navy Air Rescue Swimmer, Luigi Caprio. If it's 2 a.m., a tsunami, or freezing cold, two tools make a difference. A calm voice and a life jacket. On a lake or a pleasure boat, there may come a time you're called upon to do my job. Accidents happen. I am a rescue swimmer, and I am here to help you. Life jackets. They live up to their name every day and night. Kentucky Fish and Wildlife reminds you, your life jackets got your back. And the backing of the best swimmers everywhere. We are back on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, summertime. If this is the time of year that you have time off, that your kids are on school vacation, that you're on vacation, this is when you buy your fishing license. And this is when you go, maybe just one, two, or three times a year. We're asking some of the boys that are in the know of where to go and what's the best time to go. And for the next few minutes, we'll be talking to John Williams. He is the district fisheries biologist over the waters of the southeast, and that includes uh, Laurel River, Lake, uh, Cumberland, uh, lots of others. But as long as we have them on the phone and have their undivided attention, I want to ask something that's very important, too, and that's about how to be, shall we say, less than forthright about the weight of your catch. (laughs) <laughs> One thing I've always asked fisheries biologists when they call in and we chit-chat like this about teaching new anglers how to stretch the truth. Do you have any stories about that, of how people tend to want to mislead you about the actual size of their catch? Right. Well, one thing I always recommend is don't weigh the fish, and that way you know, you can estimate it much larger than it than it was. If you actually weigh it, then you have to kind of go by what it says. But uh, And then, obviously, once you release the fish, each day they get larger and larger uh, in your story. So that, that seems to work well, too. Don't weigh the fish. That's, that's priceless. <laughs> now, you always have to tell the truth to the conservation officer about length. Then it's just the length. Now, you have, you have a slot limit or you got a 12-inch minimum, what have you, and you have to be honest about that because they'll measure it, but they're never going to weigh it, are they? That's right. That's right. Uh, so as long as it's over the size limit, uh, you know, you can make that fish as fat as you want to make it. So. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I, I see no reason why a three-pound bass couldn't be six pounds by the time you get home. Right, right. Uh, that's that's the way it works. That's uh, I think the beginning of fishing, uh, you know, fishermen have always... You know, if you're going to err, you need to err on making it bigger than it actually was instead of smaller. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever teach children? Do you ever have children come by your office, or do you run across uh, kids maybe at Camp Earl Wallace, and you have to give them some pointers on how to be deceitful when it comes to fishing? I, I think they're they're pretty good because they've listened to their, their daddies and, and grandfathers tell uh, fishing stories, so they've... It's been uh, part of their uh, fishing life uh, from the get-go, so I think they're actually pretty good at it. In the heat of the summer, John, where do you recommend for fishing in your part of the woods? And, and, and you might start off by saying, what are your woods? Where are you? I'm in the southeastern part of the state, from Clinton County, east of Bell County, and north to Rock Castle and Lincoln County, so kind of mostly around along the uh, Cumberland River Basin. Usually this time of year, I, th- I like taking... Uh, flow trips down some of our major rivers or the larger creeks, uh, especially uh, Upper Cumberland River above the falls, uh, some nice water up there, uh, South Fork, Kentucky River, uh, even the Big South Fork, uh, Big South Fork uh, Cumberland River is also very good. And, uh, you know, when you get these hot days, it's kind of uh, nice to take a, uh, you know, take a canoe or a small john boat and put in and just kind of have a lazy day floating down the river and and uh, most of the time, the river fish bite pretty well. You can catch a variety of bass or sunfish and, you know, take a, a lunch and picnic along the shoreline. It makes for a, a nice early summer day. Nothing better than a good float trip. Let me ask you, though, how do you, what, how do you go about finding out 
exactly what class of rapids you may be getting into. Because if you're going to do maybe above a class one or two, you're going to need a little bit of experience, wouldn't you say? Right, right. You should. Uh, and and to be honest, I, I don't. Uh, you know, I like fairly slack water when I when I take a, a trip. I'm not. Uh, you know, one of the kayakers going over Cumberland Falls, uh, but uh, you know, if you go above the falls, it's it's kind of uh, wide, shallow, uh, flat rocks with uh, kind of uh, you know potholes and stuff that uh, that you can catch the fish in. And I, I generally stay in the calmer waters. I've often wondered this, and I've been to Cumberland Falls a few times. How far upstream from the falls do you start seeing signage? Hey, there's a big waterfall ahead. Pull over. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, there's a uh, Highway 90 bridge that's uh, oh, probably 100 yards above the falls, and uh, I always tell people make sure that you're, you know, you're taking out when you're getting to that bridge because if you don't take out then, uh, you know, it's uh, the next <laughs> the next spot's uh, over the falls, and you certainly don't want to do that. So if you see a bridge, you need to be getting out of the water. If you start below the falls, toward but somewhere between the falls and Lake Cumberland, you still have some rapids in there, and I'm bringing all this up, not because everybody is daredevils, but that you may not know. Right, right. You do have some rapids there, and especially once the, uh, you know, in the, with the lake having been down the last several years, it's even made, you know, more of a length of riverine-type water. It's my understanding that you can take some, you know, guided trips uh, that put in just below the falls and take out at the mouth of Laurel Ramp, uh, where the Laurel Tailwater is going to the Cumberland River. Uh, I personally never tried that, but I've, I've heard it's a nice trip. For fishing in the summer when it's not as wondrous as in the fall and spring, what's your advice on exactly where to go? And you said take some float trips, but early, late, farm ponds, what would you suggest for folks in south-central Kentucky? Right. In the, you know, in the heat of the summer, I, you know, it's ideally you'd get out dawn and dusk or, or good or, you know, late in the day, uh, usually a little bit cooler um, so you're not... You know, you're not sweating <laughs> while you're fishing, and uh, obviously nighttime's good in the summertime, too. But uh, I'd try to stay out of the heat of the, 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 the day, even though one of the good things about river fishing is is uh, usually the, the fish bite pretty readily, uh, you know, whenever. So uh, uh, I've yet to go to a, really any river, and you can throw out about any kind of thing, and, you know, a jig or a little small crankbait, and you'll catch something. What are some of the most popular rivers in your stretch of the woods and beyond Cumberland? Well, the uh, uh, as I mentioned, the Upper Cumberland above the falls is good. The Big South Fork on the other uh, the other major tributary going into Lake Cumberland is good. Even the Cumberland Tailwaters. Uh, the benefit uh, in the Tailwaters is you've got that cool water coming out of the bottom of the lake, so it's kind of like uh, air conditioning during the summertime, uh, especially as you're if you're close to the dam. Um, one of the other major rivers that I think is really good is South Fork Kentucky River, and and then we've got some other what I would call large streams that uh, that are pretty good. Redbird River, uh, so some of those. But you know, any of the uh, medium to larger larger rivers are are good uh, during the summertime. And you have a few Finns lakes in the area. Our newest Finn Lake is in uh, Barberville, Kentucky, the Brickyard Ponds, and I'm by there quite often, and it gets uh, a lot of use. I think, uh, uh, you know, when it gets stocked uh, periodically, and, and that's uh, next to uh, a lot of housing, and, and it's uh, next to a city park, so it gets a lot of use, and that's uh, access totally around the lake. Uh, you can find you a nice spot to fish, and uh, I do know they catch quite a few fish there. As far as stockings in the warmer months, are there are there catfish being uh, being stocked? Yeah, they, the the catfish are stocked during the warmer months, and then uh, the the trout are stocked during uh, you know the winter months. So uh, that native strain of walleye you found down that was in your part of the world, wasn't it? Originally, the natives we found were in the Rock Castle River. Uh, that's the ones we have been propagating in the hatcheries and stocking a few other places. But uh, uh, we also found some natives in uh, the Big South Fork Cumberland River, you know, which they'd all be part of the same, originally was part of the same system, you know, the Rock Castle drains into the Cumberland. But uh, we're, we're, uh, Dave Drees went into the Big South Fork again uh, about a month ago and found 
collected 15 walleye, and, and he got fin clips off of them, and they're in the process of being analyzed. So we'll see if any of those are uh, natives, too. The further up the Big South Fork you go, the more, I guess, toward Tennessee, you know, and away from the lake, the more ch- the bigger chances of getting a, a native. As far as just looking at one, I've had a lot of old-timers say, yeah, you can tell that's a native. Or, but, but I, I mean, I've looked at hundreds of both, and you can't tell the difference by looking. But you thought they were extinct or extirpated, or what's the proper word? Originally, you know, we had heard stories about uh, walleye up in the big up in the Rock Castle River that the old timers caught, and we thought um, we didn't know we had any natives left. But we thought if we did have natives left, then and those stories were true about them catching them way up in the river, then that would be a place to look, and so. Um, well, this it's been a long time now. I think it was I'm trying to think of the years it was. It was in the nineties, I guess. We uh, collected uh, the first fish we collected. We sh- we shocked it up, and I had a, a, a landowner there told us, you know, where where they'd caught them before. And so we uh, and this is way up the Rock Castle River, you know, not not far below the confluence of the Middle Fork and South Fork of the Rock Castle. And we shocked up like an eight pound fish and sent it off and had it tested, and sure enough, it was different than than the Erie strain walleye that we had, you know, stocked uh, in the lakes. And from there, we've, you know, collected numerous fish. And every one we've collected out of the rock castle has been that unique uh, native strain. You know, if a fish would have come out of Lake Cumberland, he would have had to go through a pretty significant barrier, which we found out they can do, and, and then gone way upstream. And it seemed like people were catching these you know, during not just during spawning time, but during the middle of summer and in the fall, where you know where you'd think they must be resident fish instead of fish that's coming out of the lake and running up to the river, you know, just to spawn. So after we got to, I talked to some of the locals and they said, "Why, well, yeah, we catch them up here, you know, pretty much all the time." Can people stop by your office and pick up any further information? Maybe talk to you personally if you happen to be here. Yes, they certainly can. We, we've uh, recently moved our office to uh, Somerset, and we're at uh, 135 Realty Lane in Somerset. And uh, they can stop by our office or give us a call at uh, 606-677-4096. John, I've kept you long enough. Thanks for calling in. All right, my pleasure. That's John Williams, the district fisheries biologist over Lake Cumberland and all the waters of southeastern Kentucky. This is Charlie Baglin. More to come. This is Kentucky Field Radio. The bad news is summer season also means tick season. The good news is next on Kentucky Field Radio. If the warm weather has you doing such things as shoreline fishing, hiking, camping, or maybe mowing high grass, the Department for Public Health and the Department of Fish and Wildlife want you to be aware of ticks. While Lyme disease is one of the more feared tick-borne diseases, it poses virtually no threat in the Commonwealth. We are not recommending that people get Lyme vaccine routinely. Uh, It's only recommended for people that live in endemic areas. In other words, places where the disease is commonly found. We do not commonly find Lyme disease in Kentucky. That's Dr. Michael Auslander. While Lyme disease is of no real concern in Kentucky, ticks still cause a variety of other ailments, from a simple skin rash to Rocky Mountain spotted fever. If you're going to be in the outdoors, you should wear long sleeves, your pants leg tucked into your boots or socks if possible, and use DEET or other proven tick repellents. And then the other thing is, if you have a tick attached to you and it's removed immediately, the the risk of developing the disease is is very decreased. For Lyme disease, we know the tick has to be attached at least 24 hours. Check for ticks often, starting with any exposed areas of skin, such as arms, ankles, and your head. Dr. Auslander says that the tick that carries Lyme disease is exceedingly rare in Kentucky, although it thrives in the Northeast. But records here show that in Kentucky, there is less than one case per 100,000 people. Whereas if you live in Lyme, Connecticut, it's a little bit over one per 100. If you find a tick on your body, its small head will likely be buried in your skin. To remove it, use tweezers. Pick up the body of the tick and pull slowly and gently straight out. 
Folk remedies such as touching a match or a cigarette to the tick can actually cause more harm than good because it can cause the tick to release secretions into your system. One thing is just keep your grass cut around your house and your yard. Ticks are not found on cut grass. They're only found on the high weeds and the brush and that type of thing. And don't forget to check your pet. Tick season continues into September, and it's important to develop tick awareness habits early. Warm weather is just getting started, and so are the ticks. Kentucky Field Radio is a broadcast service of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, your partner in the great outdoors. Jerry Bynack, the Assistant Fisheries Director with the Kentucky Division of Fisheries. We've got some leftover questions from the fishing call-in show that TV put on back in the spring, but we get so many questions, Jerry, that we cannot answer them all. Tim Farmer does his best. Uh, You ready to roll? I'm ready to go. Sean from Bloomfield, he wants to know about the new Sawguy program. What is that? Okay, uh, we just started that this year. Sawguy is really a cross between a walleye and a sauger. And as a hybrid, they really exhibit really fast growth rates. A normal situation, they'll uh, reach about 10 inches at age one, and if there's a lot of forage, they'll get to about 12 inches at age one. They're also really good at controlling, uh, trying to control shad, bluegill, and there's some evidence they actually work on uh, crappie and improve crappie fisheries in small impoundments. Uh, we're starting small. We're looking at some small impoundments, A.J. Jolly in northern Kentucky, Bullock Pen and uh, Guest Creek. And I believe we stocked uh, about 80, couple, 82, 83 fish per acre this year, about two inches long. So hopefully in a year or two, uh, there'll be some new uh, high-quality fisheries in these uh, smaller impoundments that people can go for. Uh, another question, Robert from Ballard County. Does the moon phase affect fishing on Lake Barkley? Uh, everybody says it does. And, you know, th- just like... Uh, Deer hunting and everything else, they seem to be, uh, you know, activities, fish more active during certain times of the year, and I'm sure moon phase does affect their behavior to some extent. Out of Fayette County, Ed is asking, is it legal to use rainbow trout heads as catfish bait? Uh, technically, according to our uh, regulations, uh, and that's under live bait for personal use, it says you cannot use pieces or parts Pieces or parts are considered live bait, even though they're dead, and you can't use sport fish for live bait, so I would say no. Andrea from Asheville has a question, and I realize this question may not have a really quick answer, but she says, how do you remove carp from a pond? They're taking over. My recommendation would be, if they can't catch them all up, hook and line, which is probably impossible, that they would need to consider um, rotenoning, killing their pond out, and starting over. Richard from Madison County, what is the best place in central Kentucky for a kid's day out for crappie fishing, you think? Well, the, just about everywhere you know, around central Kentucky and the lakes, uh, there are crappie. Taylorsville Lake uh, this past year had some really good uh, crappie fishing. Beaver Lake is a little bit smaller lake. They don't have the numbers, but I've heard there's some really good crappie coming out of Beaver Lake. There is one more, and I'm almost hesitant to ask this because I know what would happen if, 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 if I were in this person's shoes. If you're on a boat and you have caught more than the legal limit, and the, the game warden, he says, the conservation officer, makes you aware that you have caught too many, is it okay to just offer to put some of the fish back or... Is he going to write you up immediately? If an officer catches a person with over his daily fishing limit in possession, he will write them. Uh, one of the main reasons you don't want to let the fish go is you don't know how long they were in the boat. You don't know if they're on a stringer, and they're going to probably die anyway. So uh, I'd say he'd be written a citation. Well, Jerry, thanks for uh, helping us fill out the rest of the show with some of these questions from our TV call-in show that we didn't quite get answered. So thanks a million. You betcha. Enjoy doing it. That's Jerry Bynack, a man who has a knack for everything fishing. Looks like there's about enough time for a good dog story. Sad beginning, but happy ending. This is out of Pensacola, Florida. Man decided that his litter of puppies was one litter too many. Jerry Allen Bradford decided he and his gun knew how to take care of the situation. He shot 
three of the puppies, and was aiming his pistol at the fourth when the pup beat him at his own game. Now, this is alleged, but it said that the pup had wiggled free, and in the wiggling around during the escape, caused the man to shoot himself in the wrist. Bradford went off for treatment at the local hospital, and his doctor, with the aid of the doctor, Mr. Bradford was charged with animal cruelty and was arrested. And we hope learned his lesson. And that lesson in my book is that there is nothing better than a dog. This is Charlie Baglin inviting you to join us again in one week. We will go inside outdoors again, right here on Kentucky Field Radio.